Welcome to The Joe Cohen Show. Join me as I share my experience with biohacking and invite top health experts to explore the latest technology, supplements, research, and resources for optimizing your body and brain. Hey, everyone. I'm here with Andrew Steele. He's true to his uh, last name. He's an Olympic medalist in track and field and a two-time founder in the health and performance technology space. So it makes sense why I wanted to talk to him. Has anyone, has anyone ever made that corny joke? Uh, no, not really. Uh, I don't know if you remember, there was a film with shacking called Man of Steel back in the day. That's, that's, that's yeah. it, the, the closest thing to it. But, uh, no, that's the first time okay. in a podcast intro, at least. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Uh, but anyway, you finished fourth at the 2008 Beijing Olympics, and uh, you were you ended up being a bronze medalist when the Russian team was disqualified retroactively. After your sporting career, you co-founded DNA Fit, a genomics company pioneering the role of DNA per- profiles and personalized sports, exercise and nutrition. And then you bootstrapped that and it was sold to Prenetics, which ended up going public. So congrats to that. Thanks. Okay, so, you know, I, I think we have a fair bit in common. We're both interested in improving our performance in a bunch of different ways. And also we're, we're also CEOs and I guess we, uh, work in the genetic space, right? Mm-hmm. The personalized genetics, nutrition, nutrigenomics. And so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm curious, number one, um, w- what are you most interested right now? Let's say in improving about your health, is it your cognitive performance, your, you know, uh, energy levels, your physical performance what's your goals mm. at, at the current moment yeah it's funny having like so obviously back in the days when i was an elite athlete um everything was kind of like on the table as an option i had like a i literally had a performance team that was there just for me and i had a nutritionist and a psychologist and a coach and you know i had this whole whole team and then and actually that my my track and field career dovetailed into my kind of startup career but i don't we, we founded DNA Fit while I was still competing and I still, for three or four years after we founded the business, I was still a professional athlete. And, but nowadays I have this interesting balance where I'm having to figure out how to be healthy without a tangible goals. And, um, that's, that's been a really interesting challenge for me because before it was literally my job to be as healthy as possible. Where it was like, and I always used to think like, Oh, why are people so lazy? Why do they complain? They can't go to the gym three times a week. It's easy. It's just three times a week. Just go. But of course, that was when I had this complete external and internal motivation for a single thing that I was trying to reach. Right. So I've, um, I've had a really interesting journey in the last few years. We're trying to figure out what being healthy means to me without necessarily a, a like black and white performance goal. So I, f- I find that super and um, super interesting how to nudge motivation and how to find people to like change their life to fit like health and exercise and well-being and all these other practices that we can learn about all day and realistically into their lifestyle. And the other change is I had kids. And so suddenly like mm. the, it thinks for yourself becomes like a, a super different model once you've had kids as well. Right. So, um, so it's really, I would say I'm in a, I'm in a transition period from like, I probably would have called myself a high end, like supplement take, supplement take out high, or doing all the lab tests possible, doing everything possible as an athlete. Then when I retired from the sport, I went to doing like nothing. I had to like purge myself of, of like anything elite. Um, and now I'm trying to find a happy middle that works in and around having kids, in and around finding a new business, and in and around not having a, a tangible goal that I'm working towards. So it's, um, it's a, it's a, it's a, I'm in flux, should we say? Yeah, but, but I think I, I think I've started to find my rhythm, basically, on that on how to interesting. How to slowly, incrementally improve. I kind of went through a, a phase uh, that wasn't too different from what you're mm-hmm. describing. So I got into this with a lot of health problems. I think I guess people get into it from somewhere. Either you're an athlete, or yeah. uh, a lot of times now people are getting into it, like CEOs, tech CEOs. They want to perform better. I got into it just because I was like, had a lot of health problems and I couldn't understand what was going on. Doctors couldn't help me. And so at a certain point, I fixed those problems uh, to, to uh, like, you know, to a degree where I was like a normal person. I wouldn't say I was completely optimal. I was a normal person. 
And I kind of just started focusing on business building and not yeah. paying attention to my health. So actually for like a, a long time, uh, like a number of years, I wasn't, I wasn't I actually wasn't going to the gym, wasn't jogging, wasn't doing anything. Like I was going for walks and stuff. I would do a push up here or there, but nothing really significant. I was pretty overall sedentary. And then uh, I would say about a year and three months ago, I had it uh, just like, I was like, I, it was it, it was like a little bit of an awakening where I was just like, uh, well, it was probably like two years ago um, where I was like, I, I started to get some mood issues again and then some other issues. They were kind of just building up that I ignored it. And I was like, wait a second, I've got all this technology, all this knowledge. What am I doing? Like, let me fix all this stuff and optimize the shit out of everything. Mm. And so I just took one thing at a time. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, one thing, mood. I'm going to fix this. Bam, I fixed it. Next, boom, bam, fixed it. I was just going through any residual issues that kind of came up over time. Uh, and I was just fixing one at a time. And then, and then uh, about a year and three months ago, I was thinking like, um, you know, I really need to, like one of the biggest movers in health is working out. And, and again, I was going for walks. I was doing some very light stuff, but I realized that I needed, if I wanted to have a long life and, and you know, uh, have the best longevity possible, I really needed to start working out. And so that's when I started to get into this um, two things. Number one is I started to work out more, exercise more. And number two is I decided that I had to be even more data driven than I was before, way more, like take it up a, a, a notch because I, I got to a point where it's like, okay, I'm working based on a lot of these symptoms and fixing things based on symptoms and taking lab tests once a year. But I really need to see how everything I need to optimize the shit out of every lab marker now to make Ooh. sure because I could feel pretty good, but then like, you know, I'm headed for a heart attack at 70, right? So that that became my goal. And so that's kind of where my focus is now. It's like, okay, how do I optimize the crap out of every lab test and uh just out of everything in my body? And so that was that journey has been fascinating for me. Um, extremely fascinating because I really learned how my body was working. Take a lab test. I say, okay, I'm going to hit this with everything I can to fix this marker. <laughs> and then I see what happened, <laughs> whether it's working or not. And then I adjust. And, and so I've been doing that for the past year and uh, three months. And that's been really exciting. What, what, what do you do for like, what's your goal? Is there a tangible goal for the reason you do all of this? Like, is it like day to day? Is it a long term longevity thing? What, what, what's your. So I have a, right. So I actually have a list. I have this 200 page document of everything I do and why I do it. No way. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Literally. <laughs> um, so like literally everything that I do, it's like, okay, I exercise or whatever. I take a supplement, every single reason why I take it. And, and that's kind of, uh, also based on that, that's why I built self decode in the way that like you get a recommendation and then you could see every reason why you may want to or may not want to take it. I also put the cons in as well because I want to know all the cons. So one goal is mood, which is I don't want to ever be in a bad mood. Yeah. That's, that's number one. So if I'm in a bad mood, then I, I think, okay, what do I have to change? Uh, number two, for example, is energy. I don't want to ever have like bad energy. So if I have bad energy, what do I need to change? Right. Um, then uh, cognitive function, cardiovascular, which is basically cardiovascular is mainly longevity thing. Yeah. So you, a lot of, I would say a lot of what I'm doing is longevity. So if you're talking about cancer, cardiovascular, that stuff is longevity. Yeah, so the reason I ask is that I find, so, you know, basically super motivated to work out. And then, um, and then when I tried to start working out and I could no longer be one of the best in the world at the thing I was doing for that workout, like it was, it's a very, it was a very interesting transition to figure out the why behind what I was. Mm. And, um, it was always so close as in when I would see the, the outcome of my why. Mm -mm. And so the interesting thing I found now is I, I could, I continue trying to be like a runner when I'd retired from the sport. And I, it just actually caused me almost like mental health issues because I would go out and I would be not even like the best runner in my postcode, let alone like the best runner in the country or the best runner in the world, right? Because I was no longer an elite athlete. So I, I've had to sort of redefine that. And I found I just had to change completely the goal, right? So it was like, hey, I'm going to do something completely different here where I'm not judging myself based off what I used to do before. So it's quite, um, 
I'm, I'm part of a couple of charities that help sports people transition out of sport into normal life. Mm. Don't like leaving the military, you know, They're, suddenly you've got this whole ecosystem which vanishes and um, and uh, you know, an internal ecosystem as well as to what you do and why. And then so it's been a really, it's really interesting. I, I think it's helped me understand potential customers better because I always looked at customers from this performance angle when I had a performance goal that was very specific and tangible. But actually the bigger impact in the broader market you can leave is those that just want to have an increased health span, increased connections and relationships with their family, better sleep, better mood, better mental health, you know? So like, I think, um, I think it's very important that actually, even if you have the most elite tip in your business that, that is possible, you still are able to somehow relate to the, the, the first principle of customer needs as to why they come to you, as opposed to like, you know, treating a particular symptom rather than understand the why. So it's very, it's very interesting thinking about a business now from scratch from that perspective. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think for me, what helps the most is having, th this is why I, one of the reasons I do lab testing is so that I can track my progress. Yeah. So for example, I, I'll give you an example of what that means. So let's say I want the best health span, right? Just saying I want the best, best health span. And it's not enough to say, okay, I'm going to exercise because I want the best health span. Maybe it'll help a little bit, but I don't yeah, it's find not, that it's well, enough. Not yeah. Right. It's not tangible enough. Yeah. What, so I break it down more than that. I say, okay, I want the best health span. What markers are correlated with the best health span? Well, it turns out VO2 max and strength is. Now, obviously for everybody, strength is going to go down as you age uh, on average, right? And so... It's not about like, you, the question isn't uh, at 80, can you do, what, what can you do? You, can you do the same as what, if you were 20? It's where are you in the percentile for your age range? And so for something like VO2 max, obviously that goes down as you age, but you could still be the highest in your, you could still be, you know, the top 99.99% .99 in your age range. And so that's my goal is I'll, so I'll take a test like VO2 max, a DEXA scan, and I'll say, okay, where am I not happy with? And it's like, okay, my VO2 max, let's say I want to improve. Then I have a very tangible goal. And so I'll retest it in, you know, whatever amount of time. And then I say, okay, did I, like, how, how am I doing with my goal? Rather than, you know, uh, working out just or exercising just for the hope that in, you know, seven, you know whatever, 30, 40 years, I'm going to uh, feel good or whatever. And I think, I think that's the gap people have got a bridge, right? Cause like when I suddenly have this long-term undefined, I just don't want to die early. But <laughs> like, it's like, it's not, it's, it's not specific enough. No, it's used right. to like such a specific thing. So, so you, I think we you said that you need like a, you obviously you need a result goal, but you also need these process goals. And it sounds like what you just defined to me is actually granular process goals, which allow you to contribute to that result goal in the, in the ending. And that's, um, that's the, that's something often missed. Some you know, public health guidance says to me, hey, you should, you should not eat this food. Why? Because otherwise you'll die early or it's not good for you in this sort of general vague advice. And actually it doesn't really, that doesn't trigger human behavior change, you know, like at that certain, but it's interesting just coming back to like health tech in, in these businesses that, you know, both of us have run over, over the years is I used to think to myself, I look, we had a lot of customers, like DNA fit, right? We were selling what was effectively a, a relatively elite performance tool. So. You know, you've got a performance goal. You want to understand the genomics layer around how that might affect your individual choices around your particular session structure or rep and set structure or nutrigenomics, et cetera. And um, we used to get people that came in and, and these were people at the very start of their health journey, you know, and it turned out that a lot of the buyers were very early in the health journey. And I remember thinking to myself, because in the early days, I had thousands of customer consults and that really helped us understand the product, but just because we didn't have a consultation team, right? So I was doing these calls. And then um, I used to think, why are these people buying this product? They should just start going for a walk every day. Well, you know, they should just start eating slightly differently. And that, that will change their health more than buying this test. But often you need something to hook onto. And that's why you find, you know, companies like Garmin selling to, you know, an, to an obese individual who is then just starting out on a health, health journey. Because often you need this motivation. You need to hook it to something, to some sort of complicated um, but like detailed plan or detailed like insights, which allows you to start that motivation. And I've come across so many people where actually 
five years down the line, they're very, very healthy. And they were, weren't healthy when they bought this tool, which from public health guidance would not have been of use to them at that stage. But they did need that to latch their behavioral change onto something. Um, and that's why I think brands often, like especially consumer electronics, they, even Nike still does today, right? Their everyday products are spoken about as though they were elite performance tools. Even though in theory, that should only sell to elite performers, it actually sells to everybody else with the halo effect. And I think it's the same for health tech as well. Yeah, I think uh, 100%, like, for example, with the Aura Ring, right? Mm. I mean, you know if you're getting good sleep or not, more or less, <laughs> right? Like, what, what's the whole point of an Aura Ring or, or any sleep tracker, really, yeah. right? An Apple yeah. Watch or whatever. You know, it, it's just that you could see it more visually. Like, okay, my REM sleep or my deep sleep or just the total amount of sleep that I was getting was less. And because of that, for example, I mean, it, it just kind of spurs you to make changes. So I find that when you test, you you were spurred to, for me, I'm spurred to make mm. more changes. When you have a very concrete goal, the more concrete that goal is. So if it's a number, it becomes very concrete. It's like, okay, I slept for this amount of hours and minutes, and it's all of a sudden like, not just, oh, I went to sleep, I, you know, I woke yeah. up, I'm, you know, I'm not sure exactly how much I yeah. sleep, or, you know, I, I'm like, I feel okay, whatever, you know, it, which, again, so it's really what, What's more important is just how you wake up and if you're feeling refreshed and, yeah. and feeling good and throughout the day. But it's a little bit like, I mean, yeah. this is funny because I'm, I'm kind of going, I'm replaying in my head like criticisms we've had from journalists or from the media around the utility of these, you know, um, luxury purchases for someone's health when they are starting out in the early stage. And then I'm thinking, well, the argument is to say, to say, well, if you're training for a marathon, don't bother tracking what you're actually doing in training. Just say, did I train? Yeah, I trained. Okay, I'm, I'm making good progress. Of course you need these tangible data, right? To, to know if you're on the right track and if you're getting there. And I just think that's a trick people often miss is that, okay, yeah, if you're, let's say you're heavily obese, you absolutely could just start doing a bit of walking and a bit of portion control and you'll probably lose some. But often you need something else in there that helps you like hook this journey that you're on onto something tangible and keep you moving every day, you know, keep you tracking. And so you will buy a, a high end activity monitor and a sleep tracker and et cetera as well. And that will help you on that journey, even if in theory you don't have at that early stage. Yeah. And then I find also that unless, you know, whether it's a supplement or a lifestyle thing, unless I know exactly why I'm doing things, because what happens is, let's say you either go to a doctor or your friend tells you something. And so what I see is people, very few people will take a supplement for a long time, right? And you yeah. ask them why they stopped. They're like, oh, I don't know. I just kind of whatever. Or, uh, yeah, they, they don't, I mean, maybe exercise some people could keep to for a really long time. But a lot of people cycle in and out of things. And for me, what I find is that if I don't have all of the reasons why I started something, then I forget why I did it. And then I'm like, why am I doing this? And so, and you can't remember, your brain could only like think of a couple things at a time. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm exercising because I want to be fit, right? Okay. You're really not thinking of all of the uh, reasons. That's one of the reasons. So yeah, I, I guess there's a, a couple different things. Number one is like tracker type stuff is mm -hmm. where you have a very specific goal, a lab test. It's a very specific number. And you can track that. Another is uh, having a, all of the reasons why you're doing something. That's one of the features that I put into self-decode so that people see, okay, if I'm doing this recommendation, why would I do this? And I would say, um, yeah, so that I think is a big one uh, because people just forget why they do stuff. And I, and I think like, let's say when you were training for your sports, um, you were taking a, a whole load of supplements, you said, mm. and then you stopped, and then you just stopped the supplement. You didn't, I, I, I mean, maybe, correct me if I'm wrong, but the way I think of that is like, you weren't even 100% aware at all times of why you were taking all the supplements you were. You never had a full list of reasons why you were taking it organized, and then you could look back and, and see, okay, does it still make sense for me? But mm. you tell me, did, I, did you have that or no? Yeah, it probably had um... Probably a bit half and half. In, in some cases, yes. Uh, in other cases, you're probably just, well, I've put together a team and, you know, like, uh, I find the, be the best uh, practitioners or coaches or professionals you have around you give you the why. So, um, 
Yeah, I've, um, about that. I mean, I've, gone, I've cycled through these things. Like, I think um, sports people have it easy when it comes to the why. Because you tell someone, hey, I'm good at this, and then maybe for Olympic gold or Super Bowl ring or, or whatever it is. Everyone in society that you touch is engaged in that same goal. And they, they're like, I get it. You're on that goal. I think it, outside of that, then suddenly it's a lot harder to say, you know, right, this specific goal I'm after, i.e. I'm going to reduce my body composition to this ratio here. I'm going to um, live for this many years without healthy or low my cholesterol. Whatever that goal is, very hard to have full sort of external and internal buy-in to the wider. And that's where I think you're right. I mean, you've got hard, right? You've got a 200 page job. You've got the wide. So that's a, that's a, a serious, a serious insult. But I think it's, um, it's something that's so often lost because you have brands that are selling you a product and they say, Hey, we think the why behind you, you should buy this and this. And then you've got doctors that have a very different motivation and they are compromising the why or the advice they give based on what we have policies and that stretch time and that sort of stuff. So it's, it's quite hard to find the balance between the two for, for consumers. Right. So I think the, the real way to, uh, that's why my approach is like very data driven. So it's like any why has to be driven by data, clinical trial, uh, you know, either a clinical trial showing that you have a certain lab marker out of a range or clinical trial for a specific condition that you say you, you have or a symptom. Let's say, say, okay, I've got acne or I've got low energy or whatever. You got the database of clinical trials to show that they're connecting this as well as your genetic predispositions. So um, that's kind of, I mean, that's how I see it, And that's why I built self-decode in that way so that you could see okay, here's the recommendation. Here's all the genetic predispositions. You could connect it to any symptoms, conditions, and then, or labs, uh, and then you could see the whys for everything and click on them and get all the clinical trials. Do you want to hear about the one health hack that is sure to change your life? Okay, here it is. Subscribing to this podcast. 67% of listeners aren't subscribed to the show, so please don't forget to show your support by hitting the subscribe button now. You'll not only be supporting the show, but also investing in yourself and your health journey, all while helping to keep us ad-free. I wanted to talk about some of the supplements that you mentioned you were taking. I'm a supplement junkie, if you will. Mm. So what were you taking? Like, give me, give me like, just give me a background of what you're doing, how much, you know, yeah. how many supplements were you taking? Back, it was um, so good. Good nine years since I had a Seven years since I retired from track and field, and um, a good fifteen years since I hit my peak. In fact, it's almost to the to the week. I got a card from the British Olympic Association the other day to commemorate fifteen years since my since my Olympic Games. So, um, so a good long time. So, like, I think back, uh, so the supplement world is kind of like um, it's not cyclical, but it's it's temporal, right? Things come in, as go in fashion, and come out fashion, and, and so on. So, like, you know, back in the uh, Back in these days, the very, this was still even the very early days of sports supplementation where people were saying, ah, I'm going to have a protein shake after the workout and maybe I'll take creatine if I'm in a phase where I'm trying to bulk up muscle mass. And that, so that was always like the extent of it. Not long before my time in elite athletics, even caffeine was on the banned substance. So like caffeine was, um, used to be banned in certain Wow. Places. Yeah. And people don't realize that, you know, like. If you'd had too much caffeine before a race, you could have failed the doping test. Um, so oh my like, gosh. It was, it was, the supplement world has really come on a lot in the last 15 years and people don't realize how sort of immature it was not that long. Ago. So, um, that's a good and point. Then I always had to be super, super careful, right? There was, um, it was only the very early days of when we even had a database that we could reference for like doping infringements and substances and what substances were actually um at risk or batch tested or not batch testing was a really early thing so i think in the uk it's called the informed sport i think there's there's a couple of bodies that do the accreditation for like um doping tested or batch tested supplements in the us as well so you had to tread super careful uh on that but you yeah, have early days i mean i had a nutritionist who was quite forward thinking on this and um just even outside of supplementation like they considered normal like regime even though i was a sprinter so I, when i competed i would run for 45 seconds and then stop mm. but we had been told to like carb load make sure you've got enough glucose like tons like 
well, as though I was an endurance athlete. And that was the norm, like in, in even in 2006, 2007. And then I remember going to, I uh, went to the Olympic Games and the holding camp, the nutritionist for the team, who was not my level of nutritionist, right? Was not my nutritionist, was having us submit these urine samples when we first woke up to my, measure hydration. I remember thinking, of course I'm dehydrated. I've just woken up. Like, like dehydration is a temporary state. It's not a, uh, you know, it's not like a chronic state. So like, they were having all the whole team overhydrate before going to bed. So they disrupted sleep. And they're giving it oh, urine stuff in the morning just so they could pass the hydration test. It's like, guys, of course they're dehydrated. They've just woken up. So now you're making the whole Olympic team like not sleep because they want to be hydrated for the hydration test in the morning. So it was um it was super early days in that. So I used to uh, I used to I used to obviously go a little bit sort of further on that like, and you know, glutathione and uh, astrazanthin and AKG and I try to cast my mind back to all of these things and even even like nicotine. So like. People don't realize sort of the, I guess, the cognitive benefits of nicotine and the lack of downsides to just pure nicotine. And um, so like a lot of the field events as in track and field will, will have either like nicotine pouches. Now I wouldn't recommend those, but even nicotine gum chewing for sort of the nootropic effects and the stimulus effect. People underestimate the, the benefit of that from a focus uh, or temporary, you know, short-term focus as well. So, um, yeah, can't remember my full list of what things. What, are, what do you, do you take any supplements today? Yeah, so now I just take um, really like a, a like a, a sort of part of the, the new business I've just found as well is like a, a daily liposomal liquid, which has like a you know, your standard kind of a daily you know, foundational type stuff in there. You know, it's in the you know, sort of gut health stuff as well, etc. Um, and then uh, yeah, you know, I'm all, I'm also like um, like getting more into kind of the an active gut health like management um, as well as I get them older. Cognitive wise, like I still like if I've got like an important meeting, I'll probably still chew some nicotine gum. Like I find that really, I find that really helps uh, from a from a natural perspective. And the the um, what's the form of Q10, which is the uh, the effect ubiquinol. Yeah, ubiquinol as well. Or okay. MitoQ. Yeah, yeah, not that brand, but it's you. Yeah, I think it's. There's a Japanese company that make it as well. Like, it's it's Kanika. ubiquinol, Kanika ubiquinol. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And then um, that's that's a hangover from my sporting days. And then um, NAD plus as well. So like, yeah, I, I have been having that sort of intravenously every now and then as well. So. Oh, you do the intravenous? Yeah, I've thing. done that. I can't say I feel anything tangibly different, right? But it seems, I don't know. I like the experience of going and getting an IV. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm not measuring enough to know if that's fundamentally changing anything. But, yeah, I kind of went through a big shift. I mean, I, it was a slow and steady shift, but it was significant in, uh, you know, again, like a, a, within the past two years, my, my whole philosophy changed to get any opinions out of the equation and yeah. just, just go based on the data, right? Like, um, what does the data say? And it's so interesting. Like, I personally think functional medicine as it is now is, is a, I personally think it's it's a mess. Um, mm. Basically, I, I know a lot of people, everyone I've ever, like, I, I did some coaching in the past, a little bit of coaching now, but nothing huge. But in any case, any time I got a client, they would always go to these functional medicine uh, or alternative functional, whatever you want to call them. They always went down rabbit holes for years, 20 years later, still going down rabbit holes. Literally, I had like a, an, and recently I just had two people that I was doing uh, coaching with a couple people and they were going down rabbit holes, both of them for years. And I was like, where are, where are these people getting this information that you should do X, Y, Z, or like, where are you getting this information that you're, you have copper toxicity, heavy metal toxicity, lime mold, whatever, and uh, PCOS and like whatever. And, and, you know, it's like, where are you getting this information? And so we did a whole bunch of testing on these people. And it turns out that this person who thought that they had all these problems had other issues, meaning like, uh, uh, I think one was actually low thyroid hormones. Uh, another was, um, you know, so certain other issues just with serotonin, uh, a little bit of microbiome issues, but like completely different than what she thought. And same with the guy, this guy was doing like 20 years of functional medicine testing. And I was like, uh, where is your conventional lab test? And he's like, oh, I don't have any. <laughs> and, then, oh. 
And then he came to India with me and we just did a whole bunch of tests on him. And it just turned out that like his issues were different than what he was being told for like years. His sinuses were blocked, so he wasn't getting enough oxygen. And uh, uh, he actually just, he, one of the things he needed was like a sinus surgery. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it was just like, it was like just data back. It was like, okay, your, your, your blood oxygen levels are lower. 95% should be higher. Like you just go through, okay, this marker is out of range. You're getting, right? And so you work based on the data and then you, you there's so many studies out there that are good. Um, that you can really figure out quite a lot. Uh, mm. So I was, I'm just shocked every time I see one of these people, they go down rabbit holes for years. And I'm just like, and, and, and my new thing is stop going down the rabbit hole, work based on the data. Just what does the clear data say? Um, not somebody's opinion. What is, and, and there's so many clinical trials out there and so many uh, studies done on what each lab result means and not the uh, alternative lab results. I'm talking about just getting like uh, an LDH test yes, or uh, creatine kinase, homocysteine, any conventional lab test. There's hundreds of them, right? What does this thing mean in the body? And you could put a picture of the body together and, and, and also looking at your genetic predispositions. What is your predisposition to different labs or different conditions or whatever? So we have so much information that you could put together that's based on very solid data. There's no need to go to uh, theories that are just complete, like unsupported, right? Or, or you know, just uh, hypotheses. Um, yeah. Well, so that's kind of IV, yeah. Or IV nutrition. So again, let's go back. I, I, I process all the information in. Let's just go back to see the facts. Okay. Number one is. Let's check what your blood levels of NAD are. It, it's a test yes. that I actually want to do and. Uh, if you're, if I was going to decide to take NAD levels in, in, in the intravenous, I would say, okay, let me see what can we test to see if this is working and if it's working in the way that we want it to work. Let's not guess. Let's not say, okay, this person told me that this is good for me. Let's look at the, the fundamental facts of the situation. So fundamentally, we see that if your NAD levels are higher, that is a good thing, right? Mm. NAD plus especially. So that means that your mitochondria are working better, your, your VO2, you'll have higher VO2 max, higher strength. There's a lot of benefits to having higher NAD in the blood, and that's proven by uh, many scientific studies. Okay. Um, then let's see. Okay, so how do we test this NAD? You can test it in the blood, actually. So take the test. My approach would be take the test, which I plan on doing, and then let me uh, see uh, how these intravenous things help. Now, without doing any kind of testing, my approach would be, well, we know there's supplements that increase NAD, right? Those would include regular niacin that is cheap as hell, <laughs> a couple yeah. dollars for like a year's worth, whatever, right? So niacin is, is the most basic way before you get into anything fancy like NR, NMN. I actually was getting into like NN, NMN, NR for a long, long time. And I actually wasn't looking at the even more basic thing of niacin. So I was actually niacin deficient for quite a while, even though I was taking these other uh, nicotinamide, riboside, and NMN. Yeah, yeah. And what I found was niacin, regular niacin, was much more effective than NR and NMN for me in just giving me energy and, and improving my health, right? Really? Um, and, and that's kind of the mistake that I made was like trying to go to these fancy things without looking at the basic stuff. So... Uh, the way I see it is like, okay, you go through the list. It's like, if I'm trying to increase my NAD, I'll try niacin. Niacin doesn't work. Let me go to NMN. If that doesn't work, let me go to NR. If that doesn't work. Let me, let me go to intravenous, right? And let me see. And every time I'm going to test it and see what works. That is like the, the ideal way to do it. That is the most data driven way to do it. And that's kind of, um, I don't agree with a lot of things that like Brian Johnson necessarily does. But I, I like uh, the a, a fundamental approach that he does is he says, look, I did NMN and I did NR. And he said both of them raised my nicotine uh, NAD levels. OK. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what he takes now, but he did the test. Now, if that's and, and so we know that when you take these supplements, your NAD levels increase. So now the question is, why would you get an intravenous of it if you could just take a supplement? Yeah. And that's my thinking, right? I don't, I don't know. I, I what think the counter argument. Like, yeah. I think, I for sure, right? Like, I, I, 
I tell you what it was. I was doing this. Uh, I ended up signing up for this ultra trail race in the in the Alps. <laughs> so I had this. Uh, I'd done a load of training, and I felt like I was kind of an overtrain. Although no longer an athlete, right? This was this was this year, and uh, and suddenly I was like, whoa. I've not got much time. Like, if I need like a ton of nutrition in my vein, I don't really got this stuff. I, I, I felt I felt good afterwards, but like, uh, you know, it was also a nice, really higher spa where I sat for front of the <laughs> You know what I mean? So that's an interesting point. Let me ask you one question on like um, overall like longevity or health. But like, what's your take on the or how do you manage like the benefits of social connections? You know, as we. If we if we read through the literature on you know, the countries with the longest life or the happiest elderly residents, etc., that it seems to me like the a huge part of this equation is often ignored, which is the quality of your sort of family and social connection. Like, how does how do you optimize for that? If you do optimize for that, or, or do you? Yeah. So there's certain things that you cannot measure. Like the cognitive stuff is very hard to measure. Right. Yeah. Let's be clear about that. So if I, I take certain things to improve my cognitive function, the measurement isn't a lab test because there's nothing. I, I'll use some genetic information there. But again, most of it is just like, OK, um, you take it and you see how you feel. Right. It's, it's it is subjective. There's no other way around it. Uh, now, what I do, I don't like to only take things for cognitive function. So what I what I'll do is I'll look at the recommendations engine that we have and in, in South Dakota and I'll see, okay, X recommendation helps with these things and also helps with cognitive function. And I, I, and I just have to think to myself, okay, how much do I care about, uh, you know, is this helping enough things? So generally I won't take anything that just improves cognitive function. It has to improve other things as well, but you know, th there's going to be some things that are subjective. And so the cognitive function is just going to be subjective. Do I think that my cognitive function works better subjectively? And what I do is I do a mega dose on that because mm. then I'm able to tell more acutely. So I take up usually around three times the, the dosage that there's on the bottle. And then when you do that, you're, you're usually able to see, because they usually put lower dosages on the bottle. And so I'm usually able to feel something more. Right. Yeah. Like something tangible there. Yeah. Yeah. And so in terms of social stuff, um, it's it's not something that, I mean, that's a good question. I guess I don't really have any like hard scientific ways to do it. But what I do is like, I, I mean, it's subjective, right? When you're, yeah. you're more social, you feel better or you're happier. So when I was in California, for example, I was living in Newport Beach. I, I felt very isolated. And I said, um, and, and that happened for like a couple of years, a number of years. And I just said, I got to get out of this place. This yeah. is an isolating place for me, maybe for other people. They got good networks there. And so I, I took off, right? I went to a different place. Now I'm in uh, Tel Aviv and it's very, much, much more social. And so that was like a huge game changer in terms of my social life. Uh, and so the way I try to be strategic about it, it's no, there's nothing like... Um, uh, you know, no data oriented thing, but we, we know in like a lot of studies that uh, having a social life is important for overall health. Uh, but the way I do it is I say, okay, I need to exercise and I need to be social, right? It makes me happier. Uh, how do I get both of these things in one thing? And so my solution recently has, has like, so either I, I was playing volleyball, I was playing more social sports, but now I recently got into acro yoga and uh, dancing. So salsa, bachata, and mm -hmm. It's because they're social, right? You, you're, you're exercising and they're also social. And then anytime I go to a social event, I jog there. Uh, instead of doing like a lot of formal jogging, I'll jog there, go with a towel. <laughs> People are like, what the hell happened? <laughs> I'm coming with a towel, like wiping myself off. That's but a good that, you know, lifestyle choice, though. You know? it, yeah. it, it worked well in Tel Aviv, right? Maybe in New York, it would be different. But they, but they, yeah, I mean, you got to <laughs> optimize in every place. Yeah. But I, I think... I don't know if there's any like you can't I don't know if there's a way to quantify your social interactions and, and how that's, uh, you know, impacting you. But it's just we know that overall happiness and uh, is important for health. And, you know, you, you want to optimize that, of course, just in general, even not for health. Do you want to optimize it for you want to optimize health so that you can be happy? <laughs> right. Happiness is the goal. That's usually I've been working with a business space in the, in the Middle East. That's the moment around that. Who was almost like a, a super elite health concierge, 
and the angle they're coming at it is that, you know, don't do this just for yourself, do this for your family and the quality of your social collect and, and therefore you help, you, that will also improve your health span too. And I think it's really interesting because often we think about this sort of um, uh, self-quantification, testing, personal improvement, very much framed around being better at work and generally by sort of male entrepreneurs. <laughs> Here we are chatting about this, right? And then um, I think it's so often that that is generally the antithesis to a huge factor in longevity, which is like social connection and downtime or family and how to like, how does one optimize for that? I think it's a really interesting challenge. I think some, I don't, I'm not seeing any sort of a tech first approach, like even try and counteract that in relation to longevity or health. And I think there's, there's, a, I think there's some opportunity for somebody. I'm never really not qualified enough to do it, right? <laughs> but uh, like I said, I think there's an interesting take on that. And maybe it's where mindfulness and mental health apps meet, you know, physical health and, and that there's something in that. that right. Well, I think it's a, it's an interesting thing to bear in mind that true great practitioners probably like from an integrative perspective are able to uh, consider that. And that's, I think that's my point is like, when I was like super elite, I had a lot of people would always ask, oh, what should I do to be healthy then? You know, what sort of should I take? Or like, what, I don't know, what exercises should I do in the gym, et cetera. And like, it's very hard to say, well, here's, here's the best exercise to do. Here's the, here's the thing to do. And, it's so personal and nuanced person to person that you, and maybe, and this supports your point, is that you need to treat, it's almost like a software release, like framework, right? Test, iterate, and change, and repeat. And, you know, so like you need to validate what works for you and what doesn't. And that's why companies like to help you go and deal with it, such from this personalized insight, I guess, to on a certain behavioral need for people to understand more about themselves and so then they can make decisions which are right for them as opposed to just following like a prescribed uh, standardized advice. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, yeah, it's quite, it's, it's, it's really uh, difficult to know what to do. I, I feel like a lot of people are lost when it comes to exactly what they need to do for themselves personally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's a, a very big field. Uh, so tell me about what lab tests you do. Right. So you do, you told me before we got on, uh, before we recorded, you said you do lab tests every three months. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what you're tracking and, uh, so yeah, yeah so yeah. to standard off the shelf, like full blood count, uh, thyroid hormone, cholesterol, CK, et cetera, like everything, you know, you need to find that on this stuff. And, and I think luckily and this is part, partly a sort of challenge as well is like, I tend to be like okay and um, but then i'm always wary of like reference ranges and how useful that are hey you lower the reference range but the doctor says well that's fine because it's in the reference range but like you know i know that is lower than what i've done previously and that's why i think longitudinal data is so important in this respect so you know if if you're within a reference range but in some cases on certain market the reference range is huge like it, it's a big it's a big right. range and if you've gone from top end of that range to lower end of that range over three six months that's still a relatively significant change in terms of order of magnitude from where you were. So I, I, um, like I'm, I'm really interested in that. I tend to be fine. And I'm not How any... do you track your reference ranges like over time? Well, I always use the same lab. Um, so that, cause I've found that these, you know, as you, you are finding, I've gone from lab to lab and, and you know, if there doesn't seem to be as much consistency as you would hope, even on standardized tests. I found like, for example, like magnesium. Look, I like, I like, I like feeling like I've got adequate magnesium. And that is a bit of a hangover from sport. Uh, and uh, it's very hard to supplement like orally uh, at a good level. I used to do this protocol where you took it in increasing doses until you had diarrhea and then drop that doses down one. So you can get that. And now I just try to like, you know, t twice a week, get that in and dermally 32. I think, you know, magnesium. Have some salt. Uh, did you ever check your, um, PLA two cardiac. Absolutely, yeah. I'll show you. So um Is that was uh, out of range for me last time I did it. Oh, so I know a good way to get it down and, and again, data, not my opinions. <laughs> um so you see this, it's yeah. always on the high end. Yeah. And then I got it down here. Went up a little bit because this is when I was actually uh, a little sick. Yeah. Um but 
you see 211, like, and we give you the optimal range, um, but went down what, from what, one. It, what, it was pretty what, consistent. What, what drove, drove it down? Wheat grease. Yeah. Flaxseed. <laughs> Flaxseed oil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, and then I, like, actually, I didn't even do this in a, uh, uh, in, in a way that was, I guess, like, planned. It was just like, basically what happened was, is that, I took an omega-3 omega-6 test and it yeah. showed that my alpha linolenic acid levels were very low. Yeah. And I said, okay, so I'm going to take a uh, flaxseed. And then I took it and then I, I saw my uh, LPPLA2 went down significantly. Ooh. And I said, huh, that's interesting. Um, uh, well, I, I think I made like two or three changes, but I looked up, you know, it wasn't enough that, that it's like, hey, what's going on here? I looked up uh, flax oil and lppla2 lo and behold there's a clinical trial showing that it brings it down yeah right yeah yeah and so uh, yeah, ala is that what you think it is the driver for absolutely the absolutely well, yeah yeah and there's another one too that i just discovered so something very interesting this is actually a new discovery of mine my thyroid hormones and i'll, I'll show you something so let's say my t4 yeah uh if you look at my t4 this, these are the op, these are actually the optimal ranges, and, and yeah. they're close to the, the lab ranges. But when you look at these ranges, it's wow. around it's in the middle, middle. right? Yeah. Uh, eight. On average, it's about eight, right? And the range is five and ten and a half. So nothing, you wouldn't wink at anything. And if yeah. we look at my TSH, uh, we're talking about, uh, again, there, it looks good, 1.4, 2.2, 1.8. Like, no, here I, it was elevated, but I was sick here, February yeah. 2023. And so I was like, I, I didn't make anything of it. Here was slightly 2.76. Again, the, if you look at the actual range that they give you in the lab, it's like up to five. This is 2.76. No doctor would even sneeze at this stuff. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, and I looked at a whole bunch of other things. Now, when I look at my T3, <laughs> I just like type it in and it comes up, right? All of a sudden, we get to a little bit of a different story, right? Mm. It's, it's, it's on the lower end, and sometimes it goes low for whatever reason, right? Low, and you see it's like kind of on the low end. Now, doctors don't check T3 or free T3 generally. They're checking uh, TSH and T4 yeah, and, and maybe sometimes free T4. And that all is like, uh, you know, down the line, middle, perfect, whatever, average, right? Um, so... But when you look at this information, you, you, no reasonable person would conclude that I have a deficiency in thyroid hormone. And I actually found out that I do have a deficiency in thyroid hormones. And, and I found it out based on all of my other lab tests. So everything that thyroid hormone, basically what happened was, is like I was treating each lab test on its own. So, so the reason why I was talking about this now because of the LPPLA2, um, it turns out that uh, being hypothyroid increases your LPPLA2. So yeah, is. It, one is if you want to get it down, uh, ALA is, is, is the best way to get it down in my opinion. However, sometimes it could be elevated because of uh, just being hypothyroid. Uh, yeah. Another test uh, is like LDH. So for example, you could see that sometimes my LDH is higher Right. And again, that actually also could be because of um, being somewhat hypothyroid. Again, so it's not like yeah. full blown. I'm not, there's no way you can say I'm like full blown hyperthyroid. But basically, like I was looking at like 20 different lab markers and I was getting everyone down to where I wanted to, but it was taking like tons of work. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like I was hitting at, at it with a lot of stuff. And finally, I said, like, wait a second, thyroid hormones is like, it, you know, I, I'm clearly, even though my norm, my levels are normal, um, it, it's really like, like I, even homocysteine, by the way. So my homocysteine, I'll show you, is 11. And no doctor, okay, so this was when I was sick here. So that's why it went up significantly. But just normal times, it's like 11.1. Um, this one, when I was taking very high dose NAC. Uh, but overall, it's usually about 11. And I was trying to figure out, and, and I'm hitting this with T, uh, bet, betaine, TMG. So hitting this with like NAC, glycine, whole bunch of methyl B vitamins, everything, you name it. 
I'm like, why the hell is my homocysteine still leaven with everything I'm doing? And it turns out that people who have who are hypothyroid have higher homocysteine. So it was just like this plus uh, 20 other things kind of demonstrated that um, if I increase my thyroid hormone levels, then there's a lot of other things that are going to improve. And, and I'm not going into like everything that uh, it improves because that would take like an hour. But I'm just showing you that like um, so basically the short short story is this PLA2. Flax oil will get it down. And again, look at the data. Take an omega-3 test. And you'll see exactly what your ALA, it's a legit test. Um, and it, it, if it's low, uh, and also check your thyroid hormones very carefully and, and look at it, look at all the thyroid hormones. So yeah. definitely yeah. recommend looking at like was super high, uh, like 800. Into my oh my gosh. Okay. I feel fine. <laughs> so, no, but that, that's the thing is, that, no, that's, that's the thing with labs. You feel fine. Yeah, that, Dude, my, my LDL was 250 at once. I felt yeah, yeah. fine. Everything felt was great. Oh, uh, my brain, everything's working well. <laughs> I'm like, going to take yeah. some flax seed and we report back in it next time. Did you ever Absolutely. Check, quick one. Did you ever check your thyroid in a correlated with a period of like heavy workouts? Because then. Um, it lowers the work. So, so yeah, that was well, one. Of the, yeah. Apparently, I mean. It's quite a controversial topic in, in doping because it's not against the anti-doping code, but it is a prescription drug that athletes were apparently accessing without having, you know, a doctor who rightly prescribed them for low thyroid. And so it's like a, what they call like a gray area of this sort of ethical concern as opposed to a, a doping concern as such. Apparently heavy workouts cause this sort of subclinical uh, hypothyroid. Absolutely. Yeah. So one of the reasons why I'm, more recently hypothyroid rather than before is because I actually was never working out much. It was just in the past year where I started work and, and lately I've been working out more and more. And so I think what happened was I was already on the lower level of the thyroid range. And uh, so with the workouts and a few other things, mainly, for example, taking carnitine and niacin. So both of yep. those uh, are anti-thyroid meaning they lower thyroid uh, hormones. So I think it was like a combination of a couple of things, working out a, a lot more or like exercising a lot more, uh, carnitine, niacin, and, and a couple other things. I started eating a lot more broccoli, so the cruciferous vegetables, eating yeah. tons of fiber, which can bind to bile acids and, and get rid of thyroid hormones. So it was like, um, and also my circadian rhythm wasn't uh, that regulated. So when you combine a lot of things, it causes... Basically, like if you're already genetically susceptible to be lower on the thyroid status and then you combine it with a whole bunch of these things, all of a sudden it could make you hypothyroid even. But the thing is, I wasn't seeing these results in my lab tests, right? Like it's not like super clear, but um, looking at all of my lab tests together, I was able to get that. And so I just took some uh, 12.5 micrograms levothyroxine. I was like, whoa, this is really good. <laughs> right, right, yeah. And I'm cool. like, all right. Time to retest to see if this theory has legs. But it was, um, no, but it's, it's uh, I already saw, like, I was able to see all of my lab tests and was able to see, like, okay, boom. I was shocked by some data I retailed it. And I think the third most prescribed medication in the UK here is levothyroxine. So, um, but I very Hypothyroidism is extremely common. But I thought there was only going to be elderly populations. It's actually the, the second most, Popular demographic for this was like twenty five to thirty five that it was it was um, prescribed for here. So like it's evidently a kind of a relatively endemic issue, and I don't really hear it talked about as to why. You know, like uh, so that's uh, I, uh, there's a lot of reasons. Yeah, no, I, I actually just did a deep dive on on what like what are all the uh, factors re related. For example, trauma can uh, disrupt thyroid hormones. Circadian disruptions. Everybody's got circadian disruptions. Um, you know, eating plant-based diets, to be honest, like that will disrupt thyroid hormones based on the right. goitrogens, the fibers, um, you know, eating too much fiber. Now, again, if you're somebody who's on the higher end of that spectrum, I mean, you just naturally have higher levels of thyroid hormones and then you're, you're doing these things, maybe it'll take it to like the middle range and you'll be fine, right? Uh, but what if you're somebody who's just, I've, if you look at my tests, you see I've always been on the low end, and then all of a sudden I become a little more uh, hypothyroid because of you know a couple things that I've added to the mix. All of a sudden that that's not a good thing.
Where can people find you? I really appreciate yeah. you coming on. No, no, good. It's been a, it's been a great chat. And actually almost like I uh, had to unpeel some layers of my brain back to <laughs> yourself a lot. But, um, but no, really good to, really good to, to re, re, uh, revisit that, that side of things. So yeah, no, just, um, yeah, people can find me on uh, Twitter, Instagram. I'm just Andrew Steele or one word. So Steele has got an E at the end. So it's Andrew S-T-E-L-E. And um, I've got two, uh, two businesses that I'm sure run day to day. One is, uh, I kind of heard a pre an all natural greens pre workout supplement called Ayla. So A I L A. If you go to meetayla.com, I uh, got a, a got this. So I don't know if you've ever taken a pre workout supplement, Joe, but like they are like super old school, like bodybuilder style, like, you know, put 300 milligrams of caffeine in, make you hallucinate, <laughs> like <laughs> one of chemicals type. Tag things and they're branded that way. Uh, Ayla basically is, is being a sort of, you know, uh, sort of clean, all natural version of a pre workout. Um, so ch- ch- check out one of those. And there, uh, just, just recently actually bought that business from, uh, from the previous founder and uh, acquired that a few months ago and just working on scaling that up and bringing that here to UK and Europe as well. And oh, re- awesome. Re, re- kind of so re- reformulate and create some more, more, more products on top of the, the existing stack so far as well. So that, that's going to be good. And then the other part is I'm building um, a, a new business that's sort of currently in quasi stealth mode. We, we haven't sort of come out the gate yet here in the UK, which is going to be a, a full stack digital health uh, business, including sort of, you know, uh, spanning the gaps between sort of proactive wellness management, i.e. nutrition and exercise, et cetera, and actually reactive condition management through e-pharmacy and telehealth. So we're, we're going to go full stack where we can help you with precision nutrition supplement, with a DNA test, with a blood test, with a microbiome test, or even with a doctor-led intervention through pharmaceutical um, Rolex as well. So, uh, so we've got a, um, a big ambition there that we're, uh, that we're just starting. We are in our own lab and we're going to run sort of a, uh, vertically integrate the whole the whole thing so that's very early days for that uh, but uh so i can't not got anything much to share about that business which can be called stride uh, and uh and we're going to be uh hopefully you know quite a, a powerful new offering once we're once we're out of the game awesome that's that's uh awesome and yeah hopefully um we could work together in the future and yeah, uh we'll that's that's, that. that's yeah I, I appreciate you coming on yeah, we made it happen. We had uh, two full starts yeah. on this one. Eh? So <laughs> Richard, yeah. Appreciate it. All right. Have a great day. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. And you. 67% of listeners aren't subscribed to the show. So please don't forget to show your support by hitting the subscribe button now. You'll not only be supporting the show, but also investing in yourself and your health journey, all while helping to keep us ad free. 